Welcome to the Bright Time Live Show with your host, Dr. June Knight. All right, June. It says I'm recording. Praise the Lord. I hope I don't have to figure that out later. Anyway, June. Yes, sir. All right. Now, what I want to know is you had a very, very personal relationship in the White House as a correspondent and, of course, got to work directly in the circle of you know, I don't want to go into all the details of that, but you know a lot of things. And, of course, I'm really wanting to even go back. i got a billion questions on this one there. <laughs> uh, Trump meeting with Obama uh, under the White House, things like that. And if I ask a question that you don't feel comfortable answering, just say, okay, Steve, no, I can't go down that road. Okay, that one, I can't go down that road. All right. <laughs> I'll go down it a little bit. Okay. I have to share one thing with you. Okay. And this can benefit your listeners as well. Uh, before I would ever spoke to you, I had asked uh, one of the Pentagon sources that I work with that works at the White House as well. When I was told that the president was no longer in power. Now, when I say that, it's over the military. It's the main portion that I was told that he does not have power over right now. Yeah. But that, that part of his duty has really been relieved of. And that he was more as if he were the president of a C, or, or CEO of a, of a dying corporation uh, to deal with the asset of the company. Because the corporation's dying. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let me pause right there and say this. With me being a White House correspondent, I have not seen the correspondence to back that up, but I do know there was a um, executive order years ago by another president years back that said that if all 50 states were under a quarantine, you know, not quarantine, but under a state of emergency, that the FEMA takes over and that he would be relieved of his duties as far as the emergency. Now, I can tell you this. What I do know from reading the documents coming down the pike, the 5G document that states that he is the president over 5G implementation, not just in the United States, but across the entire globe. So, in, and seeing all of the different correspondence from the G7, which he is in, from the World Economic Forum, and then from the G12, I mean the G20, okay, which is all connected in the UN, which by the way, all of us that are from, that are evangelicals, that always saw he was not a globalist, this should show you he's a globalist. He's mixed in with all of them. But when you read the correspondent, it is interesting that it does look like his power has shifted, okay? It's maybe not over, like you say, the military, because now, even though he did order a million troops, a million troops for two years, and you're wondering, why do we need troops for two years? Okay, so he may not be over the military, but he's definitely over the business aspect of implementing 5G, which is the entire infrastructure. Okay, so now he has all the top people of the entire planet on his team. We're talking every infrastructure you can think of. The oil industry, you know, all of it. The transportation industry and everything. And so this team you know, is the ones that is advising him and they're putting this together. But at the same time, China is trying to be the ones implementing 5G across the planet through their company, Huawei. Is, how do you say that? Huawei. Huawei. Okay. And they, China give them billions of dollars to do this. And they're undercutting everybody else on implementing it in their country so this is to me this is my interpretation of course 
is that there is such strong language coming out of the Secretary of State's office and the White House about China this, China that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're on all these interviews, you know, just really putting China down. They're going after China. And Boris Johnson did sign over in the United Kingdom. He did sign an agreement with China, but then turned around and revoked that agreement and yeah, said, after he got sick with the coronavirus, okay, and he, tur he turned back and said, okay, now I don't want to sign off with China. So there is a war going on. So if I saw what I'm thinking from what I'm reading is that he has shifted over now, which is why he has all these teams, all these globalist teams, to get the implementation of the structure. And he's even been talking about it in his press conferences because I have a team of people and we watch these press conferences every day. And then I go through it like a fine tooth comb the next day and I take out parts that will affect the church. And I, another thing I just want to insert here is that I have seen an increased uh, push about the testing systems. You interviewed uh, Celeste the other day, who is an ex, to all of y'all that don't know, she's an ex-FEMA employee. She talked about the three implementations coming down the pipe from FEMA, which is going to be the test. It's going to be a test, a pre-test. It's going to be the immunization. It's going to be the jail. Okay, so we're seeing this advancement happening in the language, especially through Dr. Burks. So I hope I answered your question there. Yes. And okay. There, <laughs> one of the things that, that I thought was interesting was when I asked about, okay, if he's not, if he's not in power, then what, what I wanted to know then was then, uh, if he's not running the military, he's running things. And, I, and of course, I threw the curve, curveball in there, and that was, what, what about Obama? Was Obama actually involved in this? And, uh, and he said to me, well, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, there are six people sitting on the board now that deals with the decisions when it comes to what our military does. Wow. He said, Henry Kissinger is one of those. He said, I will not answer who the others are. But. I would imagine Bill Gates. You know, probably. He said, you asked about Obama. All I'll say is, is that Henry Kissinger helped him get elected. You can think of the rest of it however you want. And so that was one thing that kind of was interesting to me. But at the same token, uh, I look at. You know, I have sources all over the world, but one of them is in Israel. And he's been telling me now that for the last eight months that they're going to take and they're going to break nationalism in America. Mm -hmm. That was in the 5G document. Yes, it was. He is not allowed to be a nationalist when it comes to 5G. That is in the paperwork. Okay. So he is like the president of the globe. I... Which one? Mm -hmm. Talking about all the okay. My son wants to tell you something. Okay. So, at the UN that happened, I believe last year in New York. The one I told you I was there and saw. They were rolling out the Agenda 2030. So there they did they basically a conditioning effort or a soft rollout talking about infrastructure. Um, that was when everything was put out there and the waves began to go out of the globalization uh, side of things. And that was when the LGBTQT added, it's starting to add F to their alphabet now for faith. And that's when they're pushing to go to Jerusalem. So there's the ecumenical thing became more visible after that as well. So my thought is, all of that from the UN, the infrastructure pulling over to this, now it's just, all they needed was chaos. All they needed was a big emergency for everything they were preconditioned to come out and it'd be accepted. Mm -hmm. That's just my thought. 
Right. Okay. That's interesting as well. Um, I was told that there are 16 scenarios by one source. Uh, Celeste with FEMA says there's 18 scenarios that they have planned. Uh, and of course, these are phases that are, as I was told, for targeted disarmament, to where the people will never realize that they're disarming the nation uh, because they're using selected issues, such, such for example, the coronavirus. The coronavirus, I told, is a cover to carry out operations. So, if I understand it right, the coronavirus locking the people down, of course, hitting the poorest people, making them lose their jobs, driving them to a point of desperation eventually, uh, will eventually cause another domino effect, robbing, stealing, things like that. And of course, the, the people that have been stockpiling their food that also went out and bought all the guns that could possibly buy, ended up using their guns and will justify martial law for them to uh, uh, justifiably take guns without making people think they're taking their guns. Have you heard anything along Well, that? let me tell you what I've heard, sir. <laughs> Those red flag gun laws, at the same time that the Obama was at the White House last year, meeting with the president last year, okay, uh, was at the same time when the president did his complete turn left. That is what devastated me when I was at the White House, because I prayed for him all the time. I was fighting for him all the time. But when I saw him partnering with the LGBT publicly, which began publicly in May of last year. Uh, I saw him just do like this ever since then. He just went straight downhill. And after he publicly endorsed them twice, he went on Fox News on May the 8th of 2019 and endorsed gay marriage. One month later, and that was the same day that HR5 was voted in by the House, and then I was like, okay, where's the church? Where's the devastation of the church? I mean, he just did the abominable, you know. And then it was a few few weeks later, he come out in full endorsement of the LGBT Pride Month. Okay, at the same time, I'm in the Secretary of State's office and we're having the discussion in the press room, having the discussion over the embassies because the LGBT were wanting to fly their flag on the outside of the embassies. Okay, so then they made a ruling, no, you're not allowed to flag it, you know, to fly them on the outside. But I already knew through my research, that's not even the real issue here. Because they were making it sound like, oh, we did such a great thing by not having it on the outside. So, praise God, I raised my hand and was able to ask the question and I said, Okay, well then tell us what your position is about hanging them on the inside. And then they was, yeah, they was like, we're going to allow them to, to hang them on the inside. And so then they quickly changed the subject. So then a CNN reporter, very liberal reporter, sits over there and says, I want to ask you a question. He says, there's no one that's really debating them hanging flags on the inside. There's no American that has a problem with that. Is that correct? And they're like, yes, nobody has a problem with it. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, right, people. But the point that I'm trying to make is the next month is when the meeting is supposed to have happened in the White House underneath in the, in the tunnels. After that, it was like pff, complete left. It was about three weeks later, we had the white person shooting the people in the uh, El Paso, Texas shooting at Walmart, which they called immediately the Democrats blamed it all on the president and said that it was due to his white supremacy followers. Okay, so then the president turns around and goes into his Oval Office and does a press conference, which we all know that if the president, there's protocol in the White House. When he does a press briefing in the press briefing room, it's semi-formal, but not too formal, if you know what I mean. If he does it in the Rose Garden, it's 
pretty much for him while out in the rose garden. If he does it in the white in his office, in the Oval Office, it means this is official, we're going to war type of scenario. You know, if he's sitting behind his desk, this is extremely official. That's where he does it. And he tells everybody, I'm coming after the uh, white supremacist. I'm coming after the extremist. I am instructing social media to come after the extremist. And this is two months after he promised the evangelicals, promised the church that he was going to fight for them and even had a huge event in the White House where he had all these conservative speakers there and they got in this big debacle fight with the liberal uh, reporters, you know, between the both. And then he promised us then, I'm going to fight for you and make sure you're not persecuted. I'm tired of the way they treat you on social media. But he never did it. And then the 1st of August is when he went and did that press conference in his Oval Office and said, basically, I'm coming after your guns because he said, I'm going to tell them to do the red flag gun laws. Where was the church? Nowhere to be found. Then when he did his rally and said the GD word twice in a public rally, with tens of thousands of people with families, you can watch this because people told me about it immediately. Well, I immediately defended him because that was in the middle of me deciding, is he really turned or is he not type of deal? So I was defending him at that point. I said, surely he was just quoting someone. Okay, so then when I watched it, the first one he did, he quoted a general that said the GD word. But the second one, he just said it. And my heart fell to the floor because the church constantly makes excuses for him. And when I went in the White House, all the liberal media, after they got to like me, because the Lord told me to be quiet for four months and just lay low, and then they all warmed up to me and liked me. Then they started asking me, why do you Christians support him? He puts people down. His attitude is terrible. You know, and they, they seriously just wanted to know why we do this. So I told them the narrative that we all tell them, well, for one thing, it's because we knew what we had in Obama. And we prayed that God would give us somebody, and we believe that he is saved, and that he's a baby Christian. This is what we all said in the beginning. He's a baby Christian. We believe all these prophecies. He's a modern day Cyrus, blah, blah, blah. I went through that whole scenario. Okay, so now he said the GD word. Okay, I went in my prayer closet. And I used to do this for him all the time. You can ask any of my followers out there that followed me through my whole journey of going to the White House with $9 in a suitcase and no car or nothing. I went up there just strictly faith. I would repent for him all the time to the Lord and repent for our country. And when he did that, I was repenting to the Lord. And I said, Lord, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for our president to cuss you on a national platform or a global platform in front of all those children in that room. I am so sorry. And I was repenting to the Lord. You know what the Lord told me? It shocked me to no end. The Lord said he was testing. I said, what do you mean testing? And he said he was testing the loyalty of the church. I said, what? And then I was like, my eyes were open. Then I was like, he did that to see how much he could get by with the church without them having a backlash. And after that, he went completely left. After that, he knew he could do anything, and these people are going to defend him to the death. Okay, right after he did the GD cuss word with no backlash from our evangelicals and whatnot, it was the shooting. Then he comes out and says, I'm going to change these laws, and I'm going to come after your guns, I'm going to come after you extremists, and I'm going to come after you white nationalists, white supremacists. Well, I've been telling the church, they, I'm talking about the ecumenical movement because my ministries, we are the bride ministries. So God has me, you know, like protect the 
purity of the church, so I'm always going after LGBT and all the things that are attacking the church's purity type of deal. So when this happened uh, in August, now I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? Well, he just did the, coming after your guns. Yeah. He just the shooting happened. And then right after that, yeah, about protecting the church and everything. God called you. For, you know, that was your, your man. Oh, okay. All right. So I was telling the church for at least a year or two that them using the white language is an attack on the evangelical church. Okay. So the what they're trying to do, I'm talking about the ecumenical one world religion pope and the church's deal is they're trying to equate christianity with racism because of the slavery mentioned in the bible that it is written by king james which is a racist so they're trying to say that white supremacy people are all these backwood christian uh redneck people okay and so when he said he was coming after them, I knew immediately he's coming after the church. Then a month later, I go with him to the UN. I knew that I was going there uh, to film the president. I was in the back with True News. They was back there filming. And we were shocked at all of the evangelicals, our evangelical leaders, Jensen Franklin, Franklin Graham, uh, all the big dogs, Paula White, um, yeah, Kenneth Copeland, what was that guy's name that does Gateway Church? You know, all of them. Okay, so they're all down there. The president's up front. He's with the Secretary of State people because he is speaking for international religious freedom. Uh, so he's trying to make it look like he's defending the church, but it's not. It's an ecumenical deal for all faiths. So I'm back there and I'm watching our evangelicals who I know from being in the White House are not defending the church. They're actually just partnering with all these other religious religions in this and LGBT in this ecumenical move. So I'm back there with my camera and I'm looking down there at all of them right in front of the president just going around and hugging all these people from different faiths and just, you know, lolly, lollygagging down there like it's no big deal. And then I looked over and saw David Cohen and my heart fell to the floor. I was like, you're kidding. He is sitting right down there next to Paula White, right in front of the president. He is the one that is the head of the Noahide laws. He is the one from the Orthodox Jews that is at the UN all the time fighting for the Noahide laws that's going to turn around and kill the evangelicals. Exactly. And then the evangelicals are down there buddy-buddy with this guy. Something's not right with this picture. So my heart fell to the floor. I was sick. I repented again. I repented to the Lord that our evangelical leaders have gotten, that they have just basically stabbed us in the back and we've been duped. That's when I realized the ultimate dupe has happened because I just want to tell all your followers, uh, this is my interpretation of what's happening in our country because I've been across this country through many national tours. I had prayed across this country along the entire border on a six-month tour in 2017 after he got put in after doing a 40 days fasting and prayer for him. I'm talking loyal to him, okay? So I went across this country for six months praying for Americans, interviewing Americans. What do you think about having such an awesome president who is for the church now? You know what I'm saying? Like... Understand, amen. Yeah, they need, to that. they need to see somebody that is truly was for him. Yes, I did two national marches for him. I was two in DC in front of the White House. But the point is, okay, this is my interpretation of what's happened to the church. Okay, 
What has happened to the church is many years ago, uh, these evangelicals took over all communications in the church. They took over TVN, God TV, Charisma News, CBN, all of our big communications, they took it over. They infiltrated it with NAR, which is pushing all of this uh, Jewish roots, putting all these messianic leaders on all these television stations. And they turned around and they did away with the good old fashioned preaching where there was sin and consequence. Because what all of you need to realize, the main thing that NAR has done that is so grievous to God is the issue of sin. Because no matter where you at on the spectrum of being a Christian, you have to understand that sin is what keeps you from God. So if you're not addressing that as a minister and you're helping people to see what is the very thing that's going to keep you from God, I mean, you're the shepherd. You're hurting the church. So what they have done is they have went to being gurus. They have mixed so much with mysticism, Jewish Kabbalah, Gnosticism, uh, mixing with the, uh, what's that? Yeah, there you go. Kundalini spirit, uh, which is like a mocking of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's where you see them doing all this crazy jerking and, you know, that all is kundalini. That's, that's not God. That's not the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what they have done is they have infiltrated the church from the inside. And they have, they have twisted the scriptures and they have, they have brought in the tree of knowledge of good and evil is what they did because they have built up self. What is the number one thing, church? Just listen to me, okay? Because I know a lot of people that I'm connected to are NAR. Just listen to me. What is the number one thing that will keep you out of heaven is the love of self. The tree of knowledge of good and evil builds up yourself. It's the very thing that it's built for. You are a God within. You are, you are so great. You are, you, you know, it's all about you and how you can lift up. In the NAR movement, that is what they do. They, they have caused people to go away from the Great Commission of serving others, going to the prisons, because they don't recognize suffering. They believe in all this prosperity and everything's all is well and, and everything is so beautiful and, and he's lavishingly loving you and dancing over you and it's all about you and you've got to go to this a conference and give us all your money and buy all our books and then we're all the same five people so we're just going to have 10 different conferences with all the same people but a different name where you can travel here and get a word and get a word and get a mantle and get an anointing and it's all about you and you and you but they have taken away from the great commission which is giving away you got to die Christianity is a death. It's not building up of self. It's tearing the self down. But how are you going to tear, tear the self down if you don't understand sin? The very thing that will destroy you. You see what I mean? So that is the dangers of NAR. Now picture this, everybody. The dangers of NAR is this. It's pride. Pride to the ultimate oomph. They have got all these titles. You have not just apostle now, but you have chief apostle. So you have all these titles, okay? And then they have all these tribes and these groups and everybody's in leadism. And it's just like Catholicism. In Catholicism, you have all this structure. It's the same way with the Apostolic Reformation, the new Apostolic Reformation. The pride level. I can tell everything what to do. I can even astral project out of my body, my spirit, and go to heaven and fight 
myself for my case, instead of me praying and asking Jesus to fight my battle, I can go up there in the spirit and leave my body, go up in the third heaven, and I can fight the devil myself in the courtrooms of heaven. It is the pride level. They're, they're superheroes with their superheroes within their own right. Now they have partnered with a president who is the same way. The chief of pride. He is the chief of like the other day, he said, I'm the king. He said, I'm the chosen one. The total power. They've asked him, are you, um, do you feel like that you have had to ask to forgive for your sins? No, I don't feel like I sin. You know, and then you picture Kanye West. Kanye West is another indicator of how sick this whole scenario is. Kanye West has declared himself Jesus. Jesus. He is God. Okay, I told all the church, pay attention to who has endorsed him. Because all the NAR, they are in the network, and they, they send these messages to each other. Do this, do this, do this, and do this. So then they say, okay, I want you to endorse Kanye. Within one week, all these big name ministries went out and endorsed Kanye. We're going to put him on the platform. We're going to give him a place. And they, he still sells his Jesus blasphemy clothing line. He still sells all of his blasphemous music where he is claiming to still be God. He is married to his Illuminati wife who is practically naked every day up on all the social medias. And then they dress like Beelzebub and do all the things, the party still connected to all his old peoples out there. And they endorse him, the pride level. He goes on Joel Osteen, one of the biggest ministries in this country. He goes on Joel Osteen's stage and he tells everyone, you know, I'm the greatest thing God has ever created. Yes, he did. Same pride level as NAR's pride level, as the president's pride level. It's the same. It's a spirit of pride which comes from Lucifer. So let me explain one last thing to your people. The Lord revealed this to me. What is the beast? I have it in like a triangle form. At the top, you have the government. This is what you're seeing happening right now. The government is flipping. They are going from an individual culture of every nation has their own individual identity, their own individual culture, their individual money, the individual way that they do things in their constitutions. Okay, so they are flipping now, which I've seen the paperwork coming through, flipping over to this one world order where everything is mutual. Everything, we're going back to uh, socialism. Everybody shares everything. We're sharing all the data. We're going to share all the money. Everybody is the same and equal. There is no more separate identity so they have become as one in the government that's why you see the word together is their key word of them being together in unity then on the southern side of the triangle you have the economy the economy right now is in the verge of switching over to a global economy of digital they're going from every country having their own identity their own uh, way that they do the dollars, the way they do their money, okay, and they're going to flip it over to a universal, everybody's equal on a digital dollar, okay, so it's flipping. Then you have the religion. This is the one world beast religion. They are taking the individual relationship of us to God, which is vertical, it's a relationship between me and God. It's very personal, and I'm, I, I like to keep that between me and God. And, you know, I have these rules I have to go by because God tells me how to live as a Christian. Okay, you have all these different religions where they all have their own different beliefs, right? Okay, they're wanting to do away from individuality, period, with humanity, government, money, and religion. 
So what they're wanting to do is the New Apostolic Reformation, which has infiltrated every faith, every faith, and they did it through the music. Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation Music has all been used to get people to, uh, you know, like let their defenses down type of deal. So they are flipping from the old order of Christianity. And they will preach it too. We hate the word, you know, a lot of revivalists, I've interviewed hundreds of them. They say, I hate the word Christianity. I hate the old order of Christianity. Uh -huh. Yeah, they call it Babylon because they're too sin conscience and they're too, you know, gloom and doom and they're not tolerant enough and whatever. They're wanting them to flip over from this uh, Christian order over to this new order that is now going to be global all as one. They're all saying this as one together unity we all serve the same god and even in the secretary of state's office they have in their international religious freedom office they have a new initiative called the abrahamic faiths initiative and what that is is where they're saying jews muslims and christians all serve the same god so y'all can come together in unity under a little g because you're all the same, you go all the way back, which is what they're saying with the Noahide laws. Let's just go back to the beginning. Forget all the things that happened after that, and we can come together as one and just realize we all love God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where the revival comes in. My son brought that up. The LGBT is calling it the Great Awakening. And why do they say that? Because the conservatives that have partnered with the president, I know I'm getting really deep and I pray people are still with me, but the conservatives uh, with President Trump's plan of this uh, Q, which I put Q at the top of the triangle, Q has mystified the president. He has made him like a savior. He is fighting for everybody. He's arresting all these bad people. There is a Q awakening happening right now. Okay, well, Q has pulled all these people from different faiths and, and the Democrats over to the Republican Party because everybody hates Satanists. Everybody hates spirit cookers. Everybody hates uh, these people that uh, eat children and these people that do all these heinous crimes. So now they're pulling everybody together as one, even the LGBT, to lead the evil Democrats, which, by the way, they're all together. They're all the same. Yes, they are. Okay. And so they're pulling them away from there and coming together in unity with the president, and they're calling it this big, great revival because now you have all, everybody's being set free of these evil people. So... Here's the deal. Satan is dividing his kingdom right now. And he is saying, I'm going to take all these people out and make the worst people look the worst so I can have the even, calm, great awakening. It's all the great awakening. And you got Lou Engel, all the ones that we all love, Lou Engel, Mike Bickle, all of them that have all been in charge of all this new apostolic reformation that is partnered and completely flipped and went over to the other side, partnering with the Pope, and I even lost a very best friend, another minister, because I saw him getting entangled with Lou Engel. And I, I had to tell him, I had to tell him. And I said, you know, I'm sitting here writing these books where I have researched this stuff for years. I'm telling you, Lou Engel has sold the church out. You know, and I was trying to warn him, he got so mad at me. And he said, what is wrong with us partnering with the Catholics? And I said, okay, then you're saying it's okay that we did away with the Reformation. And that's what they did. You have Dutch Sheets, you had Lou Engel, you had Mike Beagle, and you had uh, John Arnott, and all of them met with Kenneth Copeland and met with the Pope and just signed away all the Christianity rights. That's exactly what they did. 
because they said there is no longer a reformation. There's no longer a difference between Catholicism and Christianity. Now, don't you see the danger of what they did to the church when they did that? Yes. And, and let me let me throw some thoughts back your way. Yeah, go ahead. The Pope of Rome, when he was uh, still a bishop, or, or, or whatever his title was when he lived in uh, South America, he was already sending the archbishops and the uh, and, and cardinals to Israel to study underneath the Noahide laws before he ever became Pope. What? Yes. And this wow. is why we know wow. that this to be the next Pope of Rome, and it was actually uh, orchestrated by, by the Israeli rabbis because they had trained him for this position. He's also recently has now rejected the title of Viker of Christ, which is not surprising because even though I don't agree that he's ever a Viker, he's not the same. Yeah, as the right, Christ. that's but right. The reason he, he had to reject the title and is now in the literature only using his name, Pavelio, is because he's showing that he has submitted himself to the beast. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, when I say beast, what I look at is that a beast is an animal. The serpent was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field. Right. Jesus was, as the, as the seed of the woman, had to bruise the serpent's head. And in order to bruise it, it was to expose where Satan had managed to mingle in to the human race through the natural bloodline. And he did that by identifying the Pharisees as a generation of vipers. To me, that was a sign of the brute of the serpent uh, or the beast kingdom but now after 2,000 years it's reviving again but with that being stated if we go back and look at what the what the Pope has done he submitted over to the to the Israeli authority and to the Noahide laws by revoking the title so that they can bring forth their Antichrist or false Messiah now Here's what I think you could really appreciate as well, my sister, because in 2014, uh, the Lord had given me a dream, very profound, and I knew nothing really of who they are. I actually had been around people that were part of the NAR group, but I didn't realize what this was. Yeah. I, had no idea what that was like. I knew that some of these ministers called themselves apostles, and I thought it was funny because one day I had just written my first book, uh, Israel is still God's people, and it was mainly directed to try to get my people to recognize who Messiah was. And there was a minister named Jasper Anastasi, and I believe he was part of the New Apostolic Reformation. At the time, I had no idea, but he wanted to meet with me about the book I had written. So I went over to his place at a school and stuff in Fort Myers, Florida. And as I walk into the edge of their, their church there, I hear him talking to his people, saying to them, you don't have to be afraid to come to me just because I'm the apostle. I like to fill out laughing. I'm like, what does, what does, what does this have to do? What, 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 what box of tea do we need from China for this guy? Right? <laughs> Yeah. So like he thinks he's somebody, you know, and those people were literally afraid. And I'm like, I just turned around walked back off. I said, I don't have time for something like this. So somebody's gotta, you know, you know, he must be a narcissist or something, right? He's gotta yeah. be up on a pedestal. Right? Well later, you know, find out, you know, the son gets arrested, who's also an assistant pastor for beating his wife and, and then they end up having to flee town and all kinds of crazy things happen. So but I didn't know because I didn't want anything to do with it after I heard this. But anyway, in 2014, I, early one morning, I began to have this dream, and I was more subconscious type of dream. And I'm on the Mount Zion, and it had been a while since I'd been in Israel. I lived in Israel from 2004 to 2006, back and forth, not, not consistently the entire time. And uh, But while I was there, um, Things looked a lot different, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the dream, I'm on Mount Zion, but there's no sage grass. I call it sage grass. Maybe it's a different name for the grass, but 
that always had been growing there, and it was all cleared out, and it was just rocks in the area. And I see the Orthodox Jews praying. And for some reason, I knew that the third temple had been built. And while I knew the third temple had been built, I also knew there was an evangelical, that's all that, it was in my mind, an evangelical minister was speaking in the third temple. And for some reason, mm -hmm. I knew that he had been affiliated with the Brownsville Revival of Pensacola, Florida. And I didn't know at the time that that was basically like, I don't know if this guy could consider early movement of the NAR, but that was an NAR movement. All of these people were part or later became part of it. Michael Brown also was a prominent speaker there. But, and I didn't know who he was, but I knew that he was there. And for some reason, I was like in two places at one time. I could see him speaking like a dedication thing at the third temple. And, but then all these guys were over here and they were praying. The Orthodox community was praying. There was something bothering me. I didn't know what it was. So I knelt down and I began to pray. And as I did, there was a big rock laying on the ground in front of me. In Hebrew, it came across in Hebrew like an amber light. And it said on there in English, it said, there's a man drinking upon my holy mouth. And then it went away. Mm -hmm. Then it came back again. And it said, you are to remove him. And even in the dream, I was shocked. I'm like, I'm nobody to remove nobody. No, I just <laughs> yeah. I came up, I, I get up and I'm like, what in the world is that about? And I began to walk around in between the different people because the, the other uh, Jewish people were, were standing and praying and they had their hands up asking for God's intervention. But I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention to what they were praying about. And at the same time, and of course, this was the time too, the Pope of Rome goes and does the, the communion on, on, on Mount Zion. And the Israelis give them that portion as their their portion. And I remember God showing me that what he did fulfilled the prophecy of Obadiah was that they would drink upon my holy mountain. Mm. Right? And, but they shall continue to drink, which is all the Gentiles would do that. All right? But I didn't really understand. I thought maybe this dream had something to do with that, but I don't think it really does. As I went through the people, there was a man with his back to me. And as he turned around, he had a, a wine glass like that of what the Lord must have used when he was here. And he poured the wine out before I could even say anything. He said, I'm no longer drinking of the mountain. And well, I knew it was Satan. Yeah. And, but it was like Satan incarnate in a man. And then I said, I don't I don't know. I said, but you have to leave. And of course, he says, well, how long? I said, I have no idea, but you got to leave. And then I came out of the dream and I was wide awake. But what really stuck, struck my mind, and I never realized it, until people began to explain to me that the NAR, uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, were the people that were backing and supporting Trump as the president. Mm -hmm. and of course, it's the same people that are really pushing the Zionistic agenda, the Noahide agenda. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the Noahide laws call for the beheading of Christians. Yeah. You, the evangelical supporting it. Yeah. All comes out, and I, I've been friends with Paul for many years, and you know, and, and, and I'm not saying this to degrade him. I really have tried to get him to wake up to what's going on with this, but he just goes headlong right into it regardless. Yeah. You know? And 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 you know, and I have a sincere love that I didn't want him to do that, but he just wouldn't hear me. But he says to his own people, because they were giving him a hard time trying to get him to wake up too about the Noahide laws. And you know, and the beheading. And then he tells his people on a video, he said, I've known about them now for a couple of years. Well, that would make it longer than myself. Right? right? And so he says that. He says, you know why I never said nothing? Because it's not in prophecy. I I like the blue lid. I get, I made a video, and I, I pleaded with him. I said, Paul, I said, do you not realize, you say it's not in prophecy, the scripture said they will behead the saints. Yes. In the population. You know, I said it's all through prophecy. I said you just don't care to look for it. You know, and this is what's said. That's why I say they're going to bring it upon, upon us. But uh, but anyway, you know, I, it's just crazy. It's just, it's just crazy what's going on, Sister Jen. It is, but I do feel like the hour that we're in, I feel like for my ministry, for We Are The Bride Ministries, 
is that I am preparing the bride for martyrdom. And I know that sounds awful, but I am preparing her to be ready to make that choice. Because if they tell you that you, if, okay, let's just say that the ex female lady that you had on your broadcast the other day, let's say that she's right. And they're going to require that in order for all of us to go back into society, in order for us to buy or sell, we're going to have to be inoculated with this uh, gel that's going to have these computer chips in it that is going to be able to cause you to turn into something you don't want to be. You'll turn into a machine. So it's the chip. It is, I mean, if this woman drives, the chip is already here. So then the point is, okay, what is the church to do about this? Because we know the Bible says it's either in your hand or in your forehead. And on my book, in my book called Mark of the Beast, I put it, it will be an RFID chip that they will insert. I knew it was a chip. I didn't know exactly how they would do it. But I knew it would be a chip because of the Internet of Things. They want all humans. You're nothing but a commodity to these people. You are a commodity. And so they want you marked and tagged like a dog. And you know something else you said earlier, Steve, when you said about them going after the poor people. They have said it the last two or three days on this press briefing about the indig indigenous peoples that they're going to go back and retest all of them and the they've been going after african americans when they're talking about them being sicker than any other race and then they're talking about the people that live in the inner cities so i'm thinking okay because in my ear i'm thinking depopulation you're going after the poorest people and you're going to you know inoculate them because we do have a friend that i truly trust uh, Jeff Byerly, who's a, he don't call himself a prophet, but I consider that the way he does, you know, speaks prophetically. But he said that God told him that if you get tested, that those tests that they're going to begin to give now will have the virus. That what we're, this first little round that we've went through is is a testing ground for them to get their systems and infrastructure in place but what's really coming is the bank so if you get that this is what he said god told him if you get that test you will get it they are injecting people to make a bigger chaos scene and then by then you have all these uh systems in place they've already ordered all these ventilators all these hospitals being everything's already set for what is coming and then when you think about the female lady you know so i mean you have to consider this as the church you cannot love your house your car any material thing you have your spouse your children yourself you cannot love yourself more than god because if they tell you I'm gonna, you're gonna have to recant Jesus, or you're gonna have to take this chip in order for you to come back into society, and you already know the Bible says if they tell you to do that and say you can't be a part of the beast system, you cannot do that. And so then you're gonna have to choose: Am I gonna do this, even though they may try to torture your baby, or your, you know what I'm saying? Like you have to have it set in. Do you see what I'm saying, sir? I do not see what you're saying, sister. And I'll tell you, Sister Jim, both Israeli intelligence, American intelligence that I've spoken with have both confirmed that they want to do away with what they deem as undesirable, desirables. And they have titled that, both, both intelligence, Mossad as well as uh, people in Pentagon. And what's funny, Trump makes it look like that uh, he's going to deal with these white nationalists, white supremacists. I can tell you from personal experience, uh, I used to be involved very heavily in Judaism. So I know from secret circles that are people that I used to be around, that the biggest 
white supremacist ideology comes out of Judaism. Wow. Say that. Not wow. all Jews are like that. That's a very elite, small yeah, set. Let's say it's five percent. I can show you the emails where he said what I've been told. They're going to genocide your nation. They're going if they have to do a fake war and use a few nukes to break nationalism here, they'll do it. But then they're going to do away with the black people. But they didn't use the word black people. Uh, you know, Jewish, in Orthodox Judaism, Gentiles are to be the slaves of the Jewish people. I know that is a fact. From my okay. research, yes. Right. I'm About the Noahide laws, yes. With the Orthodox people, and they would say to me, Steve, come on, you're a Jew, you should know this. Okay, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Christian. You know, and I was a Christian even then, but I... They would forget that I was a believer. That would be the funny thing, you know, because I had a, such a love for my people, I wanted to help them. And so I wouldn't overburden myself, but if a door opened, I would speak to them and try to help them to know that Christ was the Messiah. But at the same time, there's a lot of good Jewish people that don't mean anything like that. They're not interested in supremacy. But in those circles, of, especially the Chabad organization, Jared Kushner Chabad, when Trump signs the executive order, on uh, anti-Semitism, which really had nothing to do with anti-Semitism, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump lead the president in, the vice president is left over there in the corner as if he's nobody. That tells you who's running the White House mm -hmm. in, my, in my book, yeah. right? You put him on the right hand, like right? Christ is on the right hand of God, now you got Jared Kushner on the right hand of the president, yeah. right? But they also told me in, in Pentagon sources that they're going to get rid of the undesirables. He said they're going to target three areas, New York, uh, Southern Florida, and Texas. Texas because of the guns as well. But undesirables. Who are the undesirables? Well, the Israelis tell me, blacks, Hispanics, Latinos, he, he's blunt about it. But like in Europe, for example, too, same thing's happening over there. All right? In, in Europe, they're saying that the people that are spreading the virus and causing all the problem are the gypsies. Yes. Oh. No, they're the bad guys. I, I saw a report on that the other day that they were going after the gypsies, yes. So well, they don't say anything about the gypsies. I was refugees. told years ago by, by, by one of uh, Obama's uh, Secret Service agents that they were looking for a way to pit the races against one another. Yes. So one thing I would say, your listeners, my listeners, whatever I can possibly do, your brother and your sister is your sister, and it don't make no difference the color of their skin. And if they yes. Know, to love your brothers and sisters of color. Uh, we're, in fact, I'll never forget, a black man told me one day, because I, I, I was really young at the time, it was about almost 30 years ago, I was in my early 20s, and, and I, I made a comment about being colored. And he, he said the thing that's never left my mind. He says, well, brother, you colored too. <laughs> and that's funny. I, I said, you just lost me. What? He said, look, he said, look. He said, Steve, he said, I'll tell you something, brother. He said, now, we all color. You color too. And he said, "You a white color. I'm a brown color. And me and my might be a black color. Me and my might be a yellow <laughs> color. We all color." Mm -hmm. And that has stuck with me my whole life. Yeah. You know. And I don't know where he's at now, but God bless his heart. He, it, it taught me something. Well, I have a question about salvation with the Jews. This is really big in ministry. Okay. I interviewed a gentleman in Washington D.C who is really high up, you know, if you do. I, he's a Jewish man, you know, he calls himself a Messianic Jew, so I interviewed him. And I asked him in the middle of the interview, just, you know, like the way I understand salvation to be is for anyone, Jew or Gentile, there is no Jew or Gentile in the kingdom. All right, so I asked him, I said, sir, I said, uh, how did your family take it when you converted? Woo, that man got so mad. And he goes, we don't call it conversion. We are fulfilled. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, no, there's no conversion. We're not leaving our Jewish roots, no. And I was like, oh. And so then I started discovering that we have a real problem here. Because you have like, okay, John Hagee, who has the biggest ministry in the, in the globe, mixing with the Christians, with the 
Jews. Okay, so I went to his conference last year and I filmed it. It's the only way I got in because it's like four knocks trying to get in his conference. He has his guards, the IDF there and everything, you know. And so I prayed and asked the Lord because I already heard that he was a dual covenant preacher, which means he believe, he tells the Jews, you know, you don't have to get saved because uh, you're still in the old covenant and you can just keep all your old traditions and we're just going to tell the Christians that we're just all brothers and sisters and we're one. You know, we need to get the Christians to support you. And he funnels all of these billions of dollars from the evangelicals over here into Israel. He's a big key to that. So anyways, I went to his conference and I prayed and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I want you to show me yourself if he is legit or if he is against the church. I went in there and I was completely shocked. I was shocked because the only ones that prayed there was rabbis. I was like, what? It was completely worship of Israel. It was like, I mean, you had the American flags and then you had the Israeli flags, but it was all Israel culture. No Jesus. No Jesus. Jesus was nowhere to be found. And I, I was grieved in my heart. And I went back to my prayer group that I was involved with in D.C. And I told them, I said, ladies, I am so grieved. I said, I went to that conference and he has 7 million, 7 million evangelicals under his ministry. And I said, I, was, I just want to cry because he really is dual covenant. He wrote in his book that he believed that the Jews can still go to heaven keeping their culture and not having to accept Jesus as the Savior. And so I thought, and then I, I sat back and I looked at how he was doing that. And I was like, you know what? That is the only way the Jews would ever partner with a Christian is if they had that agreement. Now you tell me if I'm right or wrong because why would they partner with someone that says, look, sir, I understand that you're Jewish, but every person has to get saved. You have to convert to be a Christian. We have a new covenant. This is the only way to heaven. That's and the Bible saying. said we have to leave our Jewish fables. See what I mean? So what do you think about that? I think that John Hayden has robbed the Jewish people of the greatest gift that has ever been given to mankind, and that was Jesus Christ. And I think that Jesus Christ has summed it up better than anyone else when he said to the Jewish people, except that you believe that I am, actually in Hebrew, it doesn't say I am he, but except that you believe, you will die in your sins. Every Jew that was a first convert, every single one, even the house of Israel, when they showed up on the day of Pentecost, and they said, men and brethren, what must we do to get what you got? All right? When Jesus Christ, when he died on Calvary, actually before he died, when he said to the woman that was at the well, he said, bring me a drink. She says, well, sir, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. we are dealing with one another. We got into a theological debate. Finally, he says, you know, go get your husband. Come here. She said, well, I'm my husband. He says, you had five when you were now. It's not yours. Oh, wow, now he's a prophet because he knows everything about her, right? But he says something to her that's so important that nobody seems to catch. And that was about the water. He says, if you ask me for a drink, I would give you water that you don't Yes, drink. yes. What was that water? That was the light of Almighty God that dwelt within him. All right? Adam and Eve, when they forfeited the tree of life, the eighth Chayim. That caused all of the children that would be born on the earth never to be a completed child of God. Now they've got a body, they've got a soul, but they don't have the Chayim living in them. When he breathed in Adam's nostrils, he says, He blew into their nostrils. The, the very fruit that was on the tree of life was blown into the nostrils of Adam. Wow. 
became, what does it say again? He became a living soul. Yes. All right? Yes, he became that living soul. What happened then? Then, then of course, then we find out that sin comes in, the fall happens and everything, and God guards the way of the tree of life. Yes. All right? Why? So that the children that are in the fallen state with mommy and daddy cannot partake of that. Now they have the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is the law. Wow. Right? And the law has, has come down to where we are now. Now, when Christ came on the scene, what did he do? He restored back. He brought that life of the tree of life to the human race. And he breathed, even like when he, after his resurrection, breathes upon them and says, receive you the Holy Ghost. He was yes. showing the same God that breathed on Adam was standing there now to give them the Holy Spirit. Oh, so there was, holy Christ. even when the God was pierced and the blood and the water came out and he was separated, it was showing that he was that 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 tree he was that tree of life and that water came out as a testimony of what he said to the well so in this case here <laughs> all those awesome. believers of the day of pentecost had to receive what water baptism they had to be born again filled with the holy spirit in order to come into that as jesus said except that you believe that i am you will die in your sins so john Hagee has robbed the Jewish people of the greatest gift that there ever was by lying to them, as well as all the Christians that followed. I was going to say, not only John Hagee, but all of the NAR, yeah. all of those big preachers that yes. take all these Christians over there and they do the worship and they partner with all these uh, Jews, they are just not telling them we have to have Jesus. It's like, where is the salvation? Where is well, that's the whole point of this seven mountain mandate that they go by. It has, it's a total satanic rob of the Great Commission over this way, which is souls. It took them straight from that over to the kingdom mountains. Go to the top of the mountain. I am better than everyone else I have arrived. It's that pride thing, the seven mountains versus the go after the salvation of souls which is humbling yourself you see what i mean yes i'll say this i have to say it in closing because i know i've got to run here yeah but every christian that listens to this broadcast do everything you can to do a Jesus christ because without jesus christ without his saving grace and mercy there is no hope for my people this Aww. is the end of hope I used to even think, I used to have it in my own crazy mind, okay, when the two witnesses come there, I hope the Jews to recognize who the Messiah is. And no, the hour is now, okay? If God does something else, okay, then okay, fine. But right now is the hour. Do all you can. Witness to them as the door opens. God will give you grace and mercy because there's very little time left. Mm -hmm. And we're already in a world of uh, trouble as it is that we're fixing the face on our own. But yeah. take the time and tell them about it. Jesus Christ, because John Hagee and all of his followers have failed the Jewish people. I agree. Sir, I would love it if you would let my son say the prayer and then we'll stop. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Brian. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank yes. you, Lord, for Brother Steve. We thank you for this time we've been able to hear you speak to us and give us and the people listening direction. Lord, yes. we pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. For all of these people listening and all the people who will listen, we pray that you would open their eyes. Yes, Lord. Understanding, Lord, to see eyes. the hope of this calling, to see the glorious riches and the exceeding greatness of your power given yes, to Lord. us who believe. And we ask in Jesus' name that you yes, guide Lord. your people with provision to be prepared for the days to come. We pray yes. that you protect your people. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bring us in contact and open up doors of opportunity for us to speak life, to yes, preach your Lord. gospel, and to make disciples in this um, end time, Lord. Yes, we just Lord. thank you. We yield to you. We submit to your word. We repent always and turn. And we ask, Father, that you would speak to us every day and teach us your ways. Lord. Yes, Lord. And we just pray you bless Brother Steve and his wife and his yes, family. Bless Keep him, him safe and protected. And I pray that you continue to speak to him in dreams and visions and continue to speak to him 
and give him even more um, inside um, information, information yes. and more people here and there. And I pray that you give him exactly what he needs to do his mission and assignment yes, Lord. in Jesus' name. Now, Steve, I want to pray something for you and your wife real quick. Lord, I pray for Steve and his wife, Lord. Only you know what they're really going through. The battle that they're going through, Lord, to get the truth out there to your people's Lord. The provision, I ask you, Lord, supernatural provision, Lord, send your angelic army to them, Lord, to fight this warfare that's around them in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that the purpose for their life is about to be increased in such a great way, Lord, because we all have seen nothing yet with what we're about to see. But for Steve and Phoebe, Lord, I pray for uh, an anointing on them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them uh, more peace in their heart and strengthen their physical bodies uh, to go to this next level, Lord, that you would have for them to go through, Lord. I pray, Lord, for supernatural provision of finances, provision of vehicle and gas and all the things that they need, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for all that they have done for the body of Christ. Lord, I thank you for them paying the price to tell the truth. Lord, we just need people to tell the truth in this hour, Lord. And I thank you that you have them in the palm of your hands, Lord. So I just give you praise and glory and ask you to bless them in every possible way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I bless you, brother, and I'm so honored to interview you tonight. Honor is fine. I'm nobody, sister. And if I could just offer a short prayer for you. Oh, please. I would love it. If you, if you guys would, uh, afterwards, if you could let people know how they can get your book or support your ministry, that would really be a blessing for us as well. So, Heavenly Father, there's no one like you, Lord Jesus. Yes. You are just so wonderful and so beautiful, so perfect. And I pray for Sister Jim and her son, Lord, to bless them above anything that could be ever thought of, Father. Yes, Lord. Strengthen them for the days that are ahead, Father, and all of her family that listen into her broadcast mm -hmm. today, Lord, and those that listen with us. Strengthen the people, Father, for what lays ahead, Lord, for we truly are in tumultuous times, and we need more than ever to yes. sleep, guiding on. We ask it, Father, in your precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Praise the Yes, amen. Well, I do, I've written uh, nine books, and there's four books that I'm finishing now. This one, uh, is exposing what I learned in Washington and what I've learned about the church and everything we've been talking about. I've been uh, researching this. This is my third year of research. And so this one's called the American Expose, but you can get all my books on the website at gotreehouse.org. The news, which I tell the truth, I break down what I get from the White House and the Secretary of State every day. And you can see that on our website at watb.tv, which means we are the bride, watbtv.tv. And then on our Facebook page, we post all that. We have Instagram, Twitter, and that's how you can find out all of that. So, Steve, I thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sister. Thank you, and God bless you. What was your son's name again? Oh, it's Brock. Right, God bless you. Yes, sir. Bless you too. He's, hey, he's 33. <laughs> Old as a coon dog. Yes. It's my resurrection year. Yes. All right, bless you guys. And we'll be in touch again soon, Sister Jones. All right, thank you, sir. God bless y'all. Y'all have a great night. Thank you for having us on as well. We really